if I, if I, do I really need this microphone? Probably not. No, probably not. <laughs> Mary Valentine said I had a voice that would cut steel at 300 metres. <laughs> <laughs> And she also, Mary is one of those people who likes to know about things well before they happen. Uh, you know, she ran the Sydney Symphony for years, and when it was, she discovered that I was writing a memoir, she wasn't the first to know. So I called her, and I said, oh, Mary, hi, uh, blah, blah, I'm writing a memoir. And she went, mm-hmm. It's dead silence. I said, I'm looking for a title. And she said, I've got one. Tell someone who cares. <laughs> She says, you don't tell that story publicly, do you? I said, oh, you bet I do. Look, what I've done today is write a fairly long speech. Because Mal said I had about 40 to 50 minutes. Is that right, Mal? Yes. So, and I do write fresh speeches every time I speak. Someone said, do you recycle stuff? And I said, no, I don't, because sometimes I'll use a quote, but I don't recycle. Because I think again about what you do and what we do as music educators and what needs to be done. And it's always good to have a fresh view. So what I've decided to do is look at the circumstance and then go through some past things and then some suggestions for how I think we can fix things and I believe we can fix it. I really do. <clears throat> I'm also going to be savage about things in a nice way and I'll say, Fiona, I am now going to get nasty, turn the camera off, all right? So that we don't have libel suits. But it's just that I'm very prepared to say something to someone's face, and I do, and I'm very prepared to put things in print, and I do, uh, but in a circumstance like this, we have to be very careful, because we never know what goes up on a website, right? Okay, so, <clears throat> here we go. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak to you today about music education. You, the converted, in reality, do not need to hear what I have to say on one level. But on another level, you do. Your direct and immediate help is needed now. Tomorrow morning, <clears throat> I will run a rehearsal of the Sydney Youth Orchestra in Schumann's Rhenish Symphony, Vortan's Farewell from Act 3 of The Valkyrie, Ella Jemima Moore from Don Carlo, Non Pian Drive from Figaro, Siegfried's Funeral March, and a brand new Australian work by a boy called Philip Jamison. The arias are being sung by Teddy Tahu Rhodes. I will perform the concert next week at Chatswood Concourse. 50 years ago, such an event would have been inconceivable. There was no Sydney Youth Orchestra. There was the Australian Youth Orchestra. There was a conservatorium symphony orchestra and there was a smattering of school ensembles, small orchestras, string groups, madrigal groups, reporter groups and the like. You know about that. I mention this at the outset because I don't want to take a Pollyanna approach to things but I think it's important to comment on the positive and say in spite of this was achieved, and much has been achieved. What we know, we know. What we know is needed, we know is needed. What we have to do is find a way to address the problems and then propose solutions. About eight weeks ago, <clears throat> I was guest conductor at the State Music Camp, where we perform with orchestra and chorus the Foray Requiem, there were endless wind bands and orchestras playing at a very, very high level. And I had a little vocal group that sang Palestrina's Secret Chervis, a Mozart motet, and the Rhythm of Life from Sweet Charity. While that's not remarkable in itself, it is a demonstration of how the landscape has changed over, the, say, the last 50 years. It's because of you, you people. The breadth of activity is extraordinary and the number of children involved in music programs of all sorts is impressive. Notwithstanding this, the National Review of School Music Education 2004-2005 contains <clears throat> pardon me, this statement from Margaret Sears. Margaret Sears writes, and I quote, 
While submissions and surveys reveal some fine examples of school music programs, they also reveal cycles of neglect <coughs> and inequity, which impacts to the detriment of too many young Australians, particularly those in geographically and socially disadvantaged areas. Overall, the quality and status of music in schools is patchy at best, and reform is demonstrably needed. Margaret then went on to say to Rod Kemp, <coughs> pardon me, we want strong support from your government. Now, the school review happened, and I'm going to tell you the story because it's, it's, it, what it demonstrates is why you have to speak out. It, in 2003, I was running Oz Opera in Melbourne, and I had a youth opera program, and we did the little swing. <laughs> At that particular program, there were a number of kids who now are making livings as professional musicians. Nicholas Carter, who conducted the Sydney Symphony last week, <coughs> came up to me. He was brand new there and he came up and he said, I want to learn conducting. And I said, good, you need a teacher. And he said, yes, you. <laughs> and I said, no, not me. I just had five years with Tom Woods. <clears throat> that was enough. So, anyway, I did finish up teaching Nicholas. But at every one of the performances of The Little Sweep, I stood up to the parents and I said, we're getting it right in sport in this country, ladies and gentlemen. Why can't we get it right in music? It doesn't seem to make sense. Children shouldn't have to make choices between sport and music. That was a Sunday, the final performance. On the Monday, I got a phone call from Rod Kemp's office. I was one of Rod's advisors who said, uh, Mr. Kemp was in the house last night. He heard your remarks about education. He wants to speak to you about them. When can you come around and see him? I said, now. <laughs> and I did. I went that minute. It was a Monday morning. I had no rehearsal. I went around to Treasury Place, and Rod said, well, I was, I was a bit upset to hear what you said last night. <clears throat> and I said, Rod, it's true. I said, all sorts of things are happening in sport but not happening in music. He said, look, why do you think that is? And I said, because the teaching <clears throat> is of such varying standard all over the country. Okay, what are we going to do? And I said, we need to fix that circumstance. They said, well, how do you do that? And I said, we need to speak to Brendan Nelson. And I said, Brian, I also want to point out something. <clears throat> Pardon me. In 1976, when this country went to Montreal, we came home without a single solitary medal. And what did you do? You created the Australian Institute of Sport. He said, okay, do you want an Australian Institute of Music? And I said, look, sort of, Rod. But first of all, we need to find out what's wrong. But Rod got it. Rod understood it. Three weeks later, I was in Brendan Nelson's office, and that was extraordinary. There were five or six advisors. The phones were going non-stop. And Rod said before he went in, you'll get 10 minutes asking one question, if he says, what do you want, be certain. If he doesn't, forget it. So I went in, and blah, 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 and he said, what do you want? And I said, I want you to review the state of music education in Australia. He said, education is a state affair. I said, it will soon be national. How much will it cost? I had no idea. I said, $300,000. <laughs> and one of the advisors said, we do that, and it happened. <laughs> it happened. Now, that information is still useful. Never before have we had so many opportunities in front of us to affect changes in music education. And we can all be agents for change because we have to. We have to change things as they currently exist. And no one is going to do it for us. By no one, I mean apart from one example, about which I will speak later, we must become a united force for change and seek the solution to music education within our own ranks. The concept of unity is essential. Turn the things off, please, Fiona. <clears throat> I've had a very long... I will make it... And that's really important. That concept of unity is really important because politicians love division. If there's division, 
they feel no compulsion to act. I will make it abundantly clear how this change can happen and how your support can be harnessed <coughs> while simultaneously <coughs> emphasising the need for the change to be slow, sequential and systematic. I'm also aware that there is frequently opposition to change. People don't like change. And they don't like change for two reasons. One, they don't understand it. So they say it's bad without understanding it. And two, it's easier to stay as you are. I will summarise the circumstances briefly which have led us to a national curriculum and reflect even more briefly on the past and its effect on the current status of music education nationally, followed by a brief look at the evolution of the syllabus, particularly a syllabus in New South Wales, and then I'll lead to my proposal for change. A proposal which ultimately will become a reality because I intend to make it a reality. And I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, I make no claim for originality in this proposal, but the one thing we have is hope. And we must act on that hope. With all due immodesty, I have a very good track record of establishing things and making them happen. The WA Conservatorium of Music, the Sydney Symphony Symphonia, the Sydney Symphony Fellowship Program, the Symphonia Program, Oz Opera and Victorian Opera. They all survive, okay? Because I'm not interested in me. I'm interested in what we can do. None of those things has happened through enlightened self-interest. It's happened because I believe they're important. And they exist. And what I'm saying is, we can all be agents for change. Furthermore, I won't be stopped. The very cultural lifeblood of this country and of music education is under threat from every level, right through from the universities to the educational bureaucracies, reaching a glorious peak in NAPLAN. <laughs> <coughs> Don't start me on NAPLAN. <coughs> I had serious words with Garrett on that, and likewise Julia. Julia so didn't get it. So, sorry, that was a camera off, never mind. <laughs> it's not that the universities and bureaucracies are opposed to the idea of education. It's that the educational bureaucracies and universities of the 50s, 60s and 70s are very, very different models from the models we have now as a result of Dawkins and as a result of the collapse of the binary system to a unitary system. When we had unis, TAFEs, TECs, all that sort of thing, that was actually cool. Putting them all together was a disaster. It's proven to be a disaster. That's, that is, it's not anecdotal, it's true. The notion that universities once offered subjects including languages, fine arts, medicine, law, engineering, education, has changed to include business, commerce, economics, hospitality, tourism, agribusiness, food technology, media, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> on and on it goes. So the, what was special about the university has changed totally and has become general. That these recent additions to the fields of endeavour in a university's offerings are worthy of study is not what we're talking about. The matter under consideration is that within a university, once a place where learning for its own sake was paramount and where the exploration of philosophical ideas was fundamental to the learning process, where students could promote controversial and radical <laughs> notions were all the things that really mattered, we now have a huge number of courses which are quintessentially vocational, requiring students to gather information, utilitarian and practical knowledge, tick a box and graduate. And that's true. In his devastatingly powerful and incredibly persuasive book, The Empire of Illusion, subtitled The Decline of Literacy and the Rise of the Spectacle by the American author Chris Hedges, 
cites the ever-increasing number of liberal arts universities in the USA which are closing and, in parallel, the ever-increasing number of for-profit universities which are offering business degrees. Again, there is nothing inherently wrong with this in and of itself. The concern is that the universities have become all things to all men and have relinquished their place in the world and, and have embraced the ethos of teachers' colleges, TAFEs and tech institutions to become corporate entities. The idea that university education was once very special has vanished forever. And if you wonder the, well, the veracity of that, go to a website called DeVry University, <coughs> capital D-E, capital V-R-Y. <coughs> it's a business university in Chicago. And it offers, it says, liberal arts programs. Along with business, commerce, accounting, there's liberal arts. And you know what's in liberal arts? Business, commerce, and accounting. <laughs> I looked at this website and I practically wept. My reason for going into this sort of detail is that the salvation of music education does not lie inside the university as it currently exists, or at least in the current structures that undergraduates have to endure. To fight this bureaucracy is time consuming, innovating and frustrating in the extreme. University colleagues would in the main support this notion, frustrated as they are, by endless non-productive faculty and departmental meetings, meaningless form filling in, endless box ticking and increasing emphasis on occupation of health and safety, and political correctness, turn the camera off, Jan. And the, <laughs> the technical, interpretive, and creative aspect of music lie appropriately within the province of a conservatory or conservatorium, both terms are correct, where the emphasis is on practical music making supported by necessary theoretical components. This view is considered old fashioned in Australia, but still has currency and in Europe and the UK, Royal Academy, Royal College, Guildhall, Royal Northern, <coughs> Ignatius Institute, Sibelius Institute, so on. And when Mel was talking about Finland, the kids who can't make the teaching course in Finland are encouraged to do performance. <laughs> Think about it. The kids who can't teach are encouraged to be performers. Isn't that crazy? <clears throat> okay. Nothing can replace the intensive work required in preparing a specialist musician. Work which cannot be covered on 11.45 minute lessons a semester. That's what they get at Melbourne Com. 45 minutes lesson, that's for the performance major, 11. To those of us who are still in the workforce and interested in the notion that things have to change, there are roles to be played. This change is not for the faint-hearted. Anyone who survived the business of teaching classroom music in the heady days of the 50s and 60s is not faint-hearted. You wear the mental and physical scars to prove you fought in the non-elective trenches, trying to convince year 8, 9 and 10 that music was a worthwhile thing to be done for its own sake. Do you remember 2 road work 11, period 8, Friday afternoon? <laughs> You'd get off, you know, on Ruth's homicide. <coughs> the, raw, the rewards for us were the elective classes and the occasional non-elective class, which could manage to find the music room from memory and which could <laughs> refrain from writing obscenities in the Sing Care Away books. <laughs> I must say, I often did find some very interesting titles in the Sing Care Away. <laughs> testament to the fertility of the imagination of the developing organisms in our charge and indeed a reflection on their own burgeoning fertility and maturity. <laughs> it is a matter of regrettable and indeed historical fact that the powers that were in that period could have, with the stroke of a pen, 
altered the system of appointing highly trained specialists to secondary schools and put us into primary schools, where we so rightly belonged. It didn't happen. The argument was that the primary classroom teacher was special to the primary system and should teach everything in the syllabus except scripture and library. The argument was developed with a highly specious reasoning the children identified strongly with the classroom teacher, creating a special bond between teacher and taught. That's true, they did. But now, preschool kids see five different teachers in the course of a day. So that was a ridiculous argument. There was, however, a primary music syllabus. And that, I, I, my, I've let my copy to someone, but that old 1962 primary syllabus was a very good syllabus. The secondary syllabus was given to us in 1959. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Do you love it? It's called Course B, Alternative Curriculum for Use in Secondary Schools, Music. This is what I taught from. Course, this is the Course B, prior to Wyndham. We all had this one. Then, in 1962, the Wyndham Report came in and changed the face of music forever. There's the music, okay? That is the music syllabus for advanced level courses, forms two, three, and four. Look at the size of it. That's all we had. How cool is that? <laughs> Seeing the national curriculum? Oh my God. Since then, We've been through several incarnations of the music syllabus, each one becoming more complex at its language and providing more and more frustration to teachers. Each one containing more than its share of contentious, unsupported claptrap and educational gobbledygook, which the smart teacher sees through immediately. Each one providing evidence that the curriculum writers haven't been inside a classroom for decades. <clears throat> I was forced to say that at the first meeting of the ACARA panel when we went to ACARA and the arts people <coughs> sat around a table and I said, because I could, I want to make really sure that today we are not here to support a creative arts syllabus. I do not want anything that has music, art, dance, drama and media in the one syllabus. I trust, ladies and gentlemen, we are all on the same page. And we were. Because I am shot at you. And when I rang up and say, I can't actually be at the ACARA meeting today, you could hear, oh. <laughs> <laughs> when the draft came out, I rang Garrett's office immediately, I said, Peter, the draft is a disgrace. It is a disgrace. And I rang Akara and said, I'll be in Sydney next Tuesday. I want to speak to you. The draft is shocking. You remember the opening, one of the opening statements about music? Music is composing, listening, recording, performing, experimenting. And I just, no, it's not. That's not a definition of music. Who wrote that? And the person was in the room. I said, well, it's wrong, okay? You've got to, you have to speak like that to these people. They only understand blunt attack. <laughs> anyway, I, I said I would be positive, but <clears throat> I feel better. So, <clears throat> Barry Jones, the great Barry Jones, is a supporter of ours. I spoke to him, he was on the board at Victorian Opera. And he wrote a fabulous, fabulous <coughs> paper. And the paper was to the Australian College of National Educators. And I said, Barry, I'm going to be speaking to a group of the most important people in Australia this Saturday, music teachers. Barry said, oh, how interesting. I said, Barry, I want to use the paper. Of course, quote away. So these are extracts from Barry's speech. And he was ruthless. I love Barry. He goes for the jugular. 
It's one of my mates. <clears throat> in 2000, only one country outperformed Australia in reading and scientific literacy, and only two outperformed Australia in mathematical literacy. By 2009, six countries outperformed Australia in reading and scientific literacy. 123 outperformed Australia in mathematical literacy. That's from Gonski. This, Barry goes on to talk about music, and he says to these principles, <coughs> bunches and bunches of principles, hearing is deeply integrated in the central nervous system, even more so than seeing. In fetal development, the ear comes first by the 45th day, months before the eye. Neurologists argue that the impact of sound penetrates the body and stirs the emotions more than our response to light, shape and colour. Barry is going to these principles and saying, I can't appeal to you on music for its own sake, but I can appeal to you on scientific reasoning. Now he goes on. <coughs> Pardon me. There is a continuum between living in caves with very primitive communication and basic needs and living in a modern, complex society. How far along the continuum do we want to move? All the way to Bach, Michelangelo, Dostoevsky, Stravinsky, Joyce, Picasso, or do we get off at the biggest loser, Fifty Shades of Grey, mastering a few piano chords and some chords on the guitar? <coughs> Principal's got that, and I'll relate to a particular principle who got it really well. The significance of the greatest music lies in its extraordinary complexity. The range and permutations and combinations which parallel and expand brain function, combining memorable sound and emotional power. The miracle involves a combination of labyrinth and means with clear and unambiguous message and an inner logic. By contrast, Primitive and popular music depends on simple rhythm and insistent repetition of a single message. Plato rejected the rhetoric and pedagogy and insisted on education, the drawing out of individual talent and encouraging the search for truth. There must be far more emphasis on creativity, especially music and the arts in our intellectual life. Now, he goes on at length to talk about how we fail in this country to do that. And he says, failure to explore music enough to grasp its complexity seems to be an outstanding area of failure in most of the state systems. Then he goes to mention a few state high schools in various states uh, where he says, this is not true. These state schools do very well. For example, Melbourne High, and I know Melbourne High does. In Barry Jones' remarks about hearing, there is an opportunity to make a very persuasive argument for music education as early as possible in the child's life. And it's an argument I use with principals and parents. All learning depends on a child's capacity to hear the identification by a newborn of the whereabouts of his or her parents depends on the newborn's capacity to hear. Oral discrimination, the capacity to perceive similarities, differences in sound, is vital for survival. Language is learned orally first. Music is learned orally first. The sense of hearing, this oral ability, allows one to form visual images without seeing the object which is producing the sound. A siren, a car, a plane, ideally still in the sky, a door slamming, people talking in another room, and so on. In other words, the potency of the ear is quite spectacular. Music is quintessentially an oral phenomenon requiring intense listening to comprehend. By virtue of its abstraction, its intangibility, 
its non-descriptive nature and its complexity, it demands from its listeners a requirement to focus and concentrate at intense levels in order to arrive at some form of comprehension. They are reasons for teaching music. To be able to articulate cogently what has been heard in any piece of music requires at least a study of the identifiable phenomena associated with music, pitch, rhythm, for example, ideally presented to children in a sequential and cohesive way through song from which conceptual elements are derived and studied leading to the child's own composition. It makes incredibly good sense. <coughs> Neuroscientists who continue to unlock the mysteries of the brain, an organ we really know very little about, report constantly <coughs> on the correlation between serious brain development and the study of music. As a violinist once said to me, it's not rocket surgery, Richard, is it? And I said, no, it's not even brain science. <laughs> <clears throat> the real reasons for teaching music are far less compelling to an administrator. For example, we teach music because it is good. Can you imagine that saying to a principal? That's good, principal. <laughs> yeah, so <I'm> on. <clears throat> We teach music because it is unique. Yes, it is. We teach music because of its power to evoke a wide range of emotional and physical responses, ranging from the ecstatically joyous to the most profoundly tragic. We teach music because it acts on the heart, the mind, the spirit, and the soul of every individual in an individual and unique way. We teach music because it provides opportunities for social involvement, which can only be provided through music, orchestral play, choral singing, etc. Ultimately, we teach music so children can make their own music. What we need in Australia is to see that every child has access to a properly trained, seriously musical teacher <coughs> of music. So, I've looked at the whole thing over the last 50 years. I've looked at the moves to change things. I've looked at the way in which lessons happen all over the country. And two things absolutely stood out. One is the power of the individual teacher in the room with the child. There is no substitute. An extraordinary teacher, a good, strong teacher in the room. Then the impact that teacher can have on other teachers. So you observe this teacher working. So my proposal is to establish an institute to be known as the National Institute of Music Teaching, classroom and instrumental. I'm currently speaking to Anna, the Australian National Academy of Music, because it makes sense to base it in a national institution. And it's the only national music institution. <coughs> we establish it to promote quality teaching of <coughs> quality classroom music and quality instrumental music. And quality is essential, not Clap trap. I was in Norlane, camera, <laughs> in order to address these Norlane. particular needs. Now we've done that. The National Review's there, that's done. <clears throat> we need to identify, and this is where you come in, guys, nationwide, a cohort of master teachers, initially at the kindergarten to grade two level for the classroom competence. That, by that I mean teach classroom singing properly and all the things associated with it, literacy, how to read, how to write. Now, reading and writing, 
Reading and writing music is under attack. Not being able to read music is seen by some music administrators <coughs> as a badge of honour. There's a move in Melbourne at one of the universities where reading notation is not considered important. Now, that type of moronic behaviour is so detrimental to the mind of the child and so insulting. It says, you, child of seven, are too stupid to read music. You are much better singing we have to fight that pig ignorance. It has to be addressed as pig ignorance. We need to identify nationally clusters of schools which will show interest in having regular music as part of their curriculum, but do not have the resources, especially the human resources. Now, my reason for wanting to put it at Adam is we don't need another bureaucracy. We need a place where coordination can happen. So you need someone there who will do that. <clears throat> and I have my mind on that. We need to identify within schools, people like you, who will do this work, be paid, and train teachers, currently in the classroom. Now it's been done before, that's why I'm saying there's nothing new about this. But it needs to be done nationally. It needs a national approach, a unified national approach. We need to establish a very simple curriculum that will tick all the national curriculum boxes and that's not hard, but will allow children to understand through song and basic <coughs> instrumental music, classroom percussion, conceptual notions associated with music. Pitch, rhythm, <coughs> harmony, and the like. Now, I know currently that there are six concepts in music. There's duration. Fight that. Fight that. <laughs> I, whenever I were here with children, I always say, duration is done. Say after me, duration <laughs> is done. They love to say that. So we talk about pitch and rhythm. Duration is an incredibly complex musicological problem. We won't go to I still, one of my favourite stories is that HSC kid who wrote in response to discuss the tone, colour and duration of this piece. And he wrote, the duration is two and a half minutes and the tone colour is brown. <laughs> How cool is that kid? <laughs> ten out of ten from my book. <laughs> How do you talk about tone colour? You can't. No. Anyway. We need to establish a program of work, vocally based, which can be undertaken by teachers under the supervision of the master teacher. In other words, the master teacher provides the lesson and that the, the student teacher, so to speak, the practicing <coughs> teacher, uses that lesson. And there's constant renewal because they're all in the same area. And I know who they are all over the country, really. I've worked this year in Adelaide, Brisbane, Tasmania, Melbourne, New South <coughs> Wales in the education conferences. And they're good teachers. There's lots of them, really lots. And I know we can make this work. <coughs> we need to identify approaches, approaches which can be learned and understood. <coughs> Kodai, there's nothing wrong with the Kodai approach. Or there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> we also need to use synthesis of those things or other things which teachers can find works, works for them. We need to identify material which can be taught which shows no particular musical bias but supports the conceptual work. But what I mean by that is this. I don't think you teach music by teaching kids endless two-note songs. Are you with me? I don't think you teach kids music by doing ding-dong, diggy-diggy-dong from the offshore vocal one. They are simply aspects. They are symptoms of a process. What we need to do is say, 
we teach music. So here are 40 songs suitable for K to 2. And these 40 songs contain the minor third, major third, 2 4, 3 4, 4 4, 6 8, and so on. So we teach all the concepts from music and not a method. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> There's nothing new in that, by the way. There's nothing new in that. There's nothing new in any of this. Next, we need to provide the classroom teachers with strategies. How do you do this? That needs to be, because it's not happening in the university. So how do you do this? How do you teach rhythm? How do you teach pitch? How do you teach the concept of two four? We need to have teachers go back to the idea of you teach from the known to the unknown and you don't teach symbols until they've got the sound. So in other words, you teach the symbol once the sound is in the head and they can do it. I know, I've done it with some seriously, seriously thick children. <laughs> seriously thick children who have read pitch and rhythm happily, right? Not only did they not know stuff, they didn't even suspect it. <laughs> <clears throat> we need to provide regular in-service courses for these teachers on site as ANAP, the National Centre, or indeed any other centre which we can identify, so they can be brought up to date on skills and repertoire. We need to provide the teachers who are doing that, the training, also with support, not hard. We need to provide opportunities for classroom teachers to watch these master teachers on a regular basis so that they understand that within the teaching of music they are covering all bases. We're teaching notation, reading, writing, and kids are making their own music. That's why we teach music. We need to ensure that a wide range of listening repertoire happens. And it can be anything. It doesn't have to be the Moldo. There's an enormous amount of music out there. <coughs> Fabulous music. Like, from Monteverdi to Billy Joel. And there's no reason children can't understand that repertoire and how it works, right? I just don't like junky pop music. If we can do this, the next step, to encourage the classroom teacher to monitor the kids they teach in other areas. How is the child responding as a result of six weeks of music? What's happening? I believe differences will be noted. And the reason I believe that is, I ran a program a million years ago at Blackfriars and um, Campbell. <coughs> and the teachers said, the kids that I worked with consistently in these classes had better concentration span, better focus in every other area of learning. Whereas the kids who didn't have that were just, they were doing okay. But the kids who were getting this regular stuff were working really well in other areas. We need to maintain pressure on government and authorities to make sure that they understand the efficacy of music. Then, evaluate that K to two and move through to three, four, and finally, the primary grades. While that sounds like an incredibly ambitious program, my view is if we don't go for the best and we don't think very big about this, nothing will happen. Gonski is not <coughs> the rescue the teachers are going to think. I speak to lots of principals and I say, can you tell me about Gonski? And they say, well, no, not really. Do you understand what Gonski is? It means what? I'll tell you what it means. Maybe in 2016, some <coughs> money will start to flow. Maybe. But it will come through a bureaucracy in Canberra. 
And if you're in a private school, you, as the head teacher, will have to fill out a report on all your teaching staff, instrumentals, peripatetics, classroom teachers, at the end of every year and say, if you've received money for teacher training, how has each one of these teachers improved? How cool is that? <coughs> Wouldn't you like to be the headmaster of a big school with 200 staff? I spoke to John Valens at Grammar the other day because I wanted to make sure of my facts. And John said, I have to write 200 reports on every teacher in the school, detailed, if that money comes through. It could also be turned over in the next election. But Gonski, Gonski did what he asked, he was asked to do. He's a businessman. Crunch numbers. There was no educational reform. The national curriculum is not a reform. The national curriculum is, there's nothing new in the national curriculum. The national curriculum is a bunch of <coughs> junky old claptrap. And the smart teachers will work that out. Now, I'm going to make this happen. I am. It's going to happen. Watch this space. And we need you. Do you understand? It's imperative that you speak to your local member now. Right now. You write to your local federal member. And you say, you understand, there's a movement for a serious national program of music education. Could you find out about that, please? Really? And then just say, if you don't, I won't vote for you. <laughs> Seriously, tell them right now. Tell them right now you won't vote for them. They need to hear that. Don't think you don't have power. You do. Your parents do. Tell your parents to take the kids out of NAPLAN. They don't have to do NAPLAN. It's not compulsory. If you're in a private school, you're paying 30 bucks a kid, aren't you? Yes, you are. 30 bucks a kid to do NAPLAN. You don't have to do it. Take them out of it. <coughs> Barry Jones introduced me to the author Michel Iquem Montaigne, a name I knew, but not a word. But I read. I read all sorts of other things, but I hadn't discovered Montaigne. And I found this fantastic, fantastic quote, which I want to finish with. And it's from, he was born, uh, he was born in 1433 and died, 1533 and died in 1592. Extraordinary essayist. And he said, when the mind is satisfied, that is a sign of diminished faculty or weariness. No powerful mind stops within itself. It is always stretching out and exceeding its capacities. You do that every time. It makes sorties which go beyond what it can achieve. It is only half alive if it is not advancing, pressing forward, getting driven into a corner, coming to blows. Its inquiries are shapeless and without limits. Its nourishment consists <coughs> in amazement, uncertainty, the hunt, as Apollo made clear enough by speaking to us, <laughs> as always, <coughs> ambiguously, obliquely, obscurely, not glutting us, but keeping us wondering and occupied. It is an irregular activity never ending and without pattern or target. Its discoveries excite each other, follow after each other, and between them produce more. We can change this country. <laughs>